All right, we're recording. Let's get started. The new Prime Minister of the UK, her last name is Truss. <laughs> There's a pun in there somewhere, and I'm going to find it. Truss, okay. So um, let's get started. Uh, so I don't have a whole lot in the way of announcements. Um, other than, uh, you know, we're sort of rocking and rolling with our schedule. All the homework grades uh, are up to date, other than, obviously, 2.4, which is due now. Um, 3.1 is going to be assigned today. It's due Friday. Um, we're going to, so just so you're aware, uh, a little bit of what's going to be happening over the next few lectures. So right now, we're on homework 3.1. So we're going to have 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4. We're going to assign homework Four, but it's going to go over two lectures because it's a little bit of a longer assignment. And then we have our first celebration. And then we're going to have our first exam. So just so you all are sort of cognizant of the timeline. The other thing I'll mention, and I thought I mentioned this during the last lecture, but I, I mean, I had it on the slide, but maybe I didn't. Uh, it's the employer speaker series or the employer spotlight series. So the first one's today. Um, it's in a, right after this in Shockey. The DOH is going to be there. But there's a whole host of them throughout the semester, so I'm not sure if you heard about that. But if there are spots available, you could uh, reach out to Tanner Drown. I know that our students get priority for that, so, you know, there's food. So, okay. Um, anything else? I think that's it. Ready to get started? Let's talk about the wonderful world of trusses. Okay. So we talked a, um, a fair amount about this last time. I introduced the concept uh, uh, and some of the assumptions that are, are baked into trust analysis. I'm going to go through that a little bit faster this time because I want to devote as much of the time uh, that we can today to the example. Um, I think you're going to find that, that my method for um, going through the concept of trust analysis is going to be the same as how we did reactions. I mean, we, when we were doing support reactions, we started with, I would argue, a problem that was really simple. And then by the end, we had hinges and triangular loads and all sorts of craziness. And it really wasn't that much more challenging than the first problem. It's just more. And, and I think that's probably a central theme of this class is that not, I don't really perceive anything that we do as really hard. It's just more. You just keep adding to it. So we're going to start with a simple trust, and then we'll make it more and more complicated. Um, now, just to make sure uh, we're all clear on trusses in general, so last time I talked about the two main like, applications for trusses. Uh, so you see them in roof systems and you see them in bridge systems. Um, where you really see trusses shine is when you need to achieve longer and longer spans because trusses, by their nature, are inherently stiff in terms of their weight, their, their strength, their stiffness to weight ratio is very high. So you can get a lot of stiffness for not a lot of material. But the downside for trusses is that they are expensive. There's a lot of fabrication, a lot of cutting, a lot of welding, a lot of, a lot of components that need to be put together. Whereas with a beam, you just slap a beam over the river and you're good to go. So um, even beams that might be uneconomical from a material standpoint might make sense overall because they're just simpler. It just depends from project to project. Um, now, when we analyze trusses, we make the following three assumptions that are really, these three assumptions really all are pointing to the same thing, okay? And that same thing is that we assume that truss members carry only axial load, no shears, no bending moments. Now, the way that we get to that point is we assume that all the members are connected by frictionless joints, so that basically means there's no unintended forces or no you know, uh, uh, little shears or little moments that just come from the uh, 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 the connection uh, and whatnot, that, that the only thing that we really have to deal with is what's being applied to the structure. Speaking of application of the structure, we assume that all the loads and the support reactions go to the joints, not to the members. That's another uh, assumption that ensures no bending and shear in the members. And finally, we uh, uh, assume that each joint, that at each joint, the centroidal axes of each member coincide. That is a little bit more than an assumption. We actually do that in the real world. So um, if you look at a lot of uh, truss systems, you'll see that if you look at the centroids of each of the members, they all uh, coincide. So all this is intended to reduce or to hope, you know, for the most part, eliminate the shearing moment uh, in a connection. Now to be clear, nothing in this world is perfectly frictionless. I mean, there's always going to be a little bit of friction. Nothing 
no connection is going to have perfect coincidence of all the, the centroids, but it's going to be close enough that we can uh, essentially disregard it. So when we cut sections through truss members, we only have to deal with the axial force. Okay, We don't have to deal with the shears and moments. If we cut a section through an arbitrary point in some beam or frame or whatever, we could get at most three unknown components. But if we made the assumption and set the problem at the beginning that we are dealing with a truss, then we don't have to worry about the shears and moments. We only have to worry about the axial forces. Um, as I said, the two methods for analyzing a truss are the method of joints and the method of sections. We're only going to have one lecture on the method of sections. The method of joints is really the, the one that we're going to spend the, our, our, the most of our time uh, focused on because, I mean, we're structural engineers. I, I think that in most scenarios, the force in a member here and there really doesn't help us out. We need to know the force everywhere. We need to know every force in every member for for multiple reasons. So one of those reasons is for the purpose of design. We can't very well design a truss if we only know the forces in half the members. We need to know the forces in all of them. Uh, so that's point one. But point two, um, when we get into the wonderful world of computing deformations in trusses or deflections in trusses, you can't really compute the deflection in a truss without knowing the force in every member. That you, basically what you're doing when you uh, uh, use the method of virtual work, and we'll talk about virtual work later, is you're summing the energy inside the truss and basically comparing energy into energy out to, to get the deflection, and so you need it everywhere. You need to solve the whole truss. So the method of joints, while tedious, it isn't thorough. It'll get you the whole truss. The method of sections is really for spot checking and getting forces in a, a member here and there. This is, I would argue, the method of sections is probably a little bit more valuable on the FE. Because the FE will, there's a classical problem where they will say, here's a truss, what's the force of that member? And dependent upon the geometry, sometimes the method of sections is quicker. Somebody's calling me on my office line. Oh, that's Wes. I'll have to call him back. Sorry, Wes. All right. Okay. Oh, I have to click the slideshow. One of the downsides of, of, of today's technology is you think, you know, they're calling my office line. No, now I know it here. Okay. So with the method of joints, what we're dealing with is a particle static system or a concurrent force system. The assumptions that we made basically uh, guarantee that we are dealing with a situation where joint by joint, all of the forces are all meeting at a common point. So the good news is that we only have two equations of equilibrium to deal with. The bad news is that we only have two equations of equilibrium to deal with. What, what I mean by that is... Um, each joint is, is a little bit easier from a mathematical perspective, but we can only, when we're using the method of joints, we can only solve joints where there are at most two unknown forces. So it, when you're dealing with the method of sections, you can solve for three members at a time. For the method of joints, only two members at a time. So that's one of the reasons why it's a little bit more tedious. Okay, let's get into our example, because I really want to get into... The example today. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the notebook, and I know it's going to take a while to draw a lot of this, but I kind of want to talk about what's going on with this problem, uh, why I picked it, and um, what I what I mean by the problems getting more and more complicated as the uh, semester progresses. So we're going to determine the internal member forces of this plane truss using the method of joints. Um, trusses by their very nature, are going to have members that are horizontal, members that are vertical, and members that are diagonal. Okay, and the diagonal members are going to be at some slope ratio. Okay, so this truss has had been it is configured in such a way that all of the diagonals are at the same slope ratio. Okay, so the next truss that we deal with is going to have members where they're at different slope ratios. Okay. To be clear, once you learn how to do a truss, you've pretty much figured them all out. Um, but uh, uh, I want to take my time with it. Okay. So again, we're going to start off simple, then we're going to work our way up. Okay. So that's point one. One of the other points I want to mention are the reactions. I mentioned this last time, but I'll but I'll uh, reemphasize it this time. We had. Four homework assignments and seven in-class examples, four lectures devoted just to support reactions. I think we're good there. So on 
this problem, I've given you the support reactions. I just gave them to you. This one's 15 kips to the left, this is 12 and a half kips up, this is 17 and a half kips up. I'm more than happy to solve those if you would like. But at this point, I think I can give them to you, and I think we can be comfortable in our analysis. Now, I know that there's going to be some homework assignments where you have to solve for the uh, uh, reactions, but for the purposes of in-class uh, uh, calculations, I think that's fine if I give it to you. Everybody else okay with that? Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to utilize the method of joints to solve this truss from start to finish. Now, I can put this here on, on the screen, and I will do this at some point, but one of the things I kind of like to do when I'm utilizing the method of joints is I kind of like to have just a little bit of a scratch picture of the truss off to the side. So I'm just drawing a little picture off to the side, um, and I want to use this as sort of a, um, uh, uh, how can I put this, a um, little legend, if you will, or a little cheat sheet for going about solving the truss. Okay, so we have five joints in this truss. We have A, we have B, we have C, uh, D, and E. Okay, so this is D, this is D. Okay. So what we have to do is we have to start, so we're using the method of joints. The method of joints, um, states that we can only solve a joint that has at most two unknowns. So my question for you, can I go ahead and start this problem by analyzing joint B? No. There are four unknown member forces going through joint B, right? I can't start there, okay? So I can't start at B, I can't start at D, and I can't start at E, right? These have three unknowns, this one has four, okay? So the first thing that I need to do is I need to figure out where I'm going to start. And there's really only two joints that I can start at, joint A or joint C. Now, is there any magic to picking one versus the other? No, I could start at either one, okay? So... Um, to keep things simple, I'm going to start at the left, work my way over. So I'm going to start with joint A. Okay? And I'm going to sort of write this off to the side, and you'll see why I'm doing this here in a second. I think sometimes it's valuable to have a strategy for solving trusses from start to finish. In other words, don't just blindly go in and just start solving joints. Kind of have a game plan as to how you're going to go from start to finish. So we're going to start with joint A. Okay, So I'm going to show you how I go about a method of joints analysis. So... Let's start off with joint A. Okay. So, let's do joint A. So, we're looking at joint A. So, the first thing that I do is I draw the joint. So, there's, we'll put the joint like right there. Uh, and then, the next thing I'll do is I'll draw the members. There's the members there. And the members there. Okay. So that's what I've got there. Next thing what I'll do is I'll see, are there any loads that are applied to that joint? And the answer is yes, I have two loads applied to that joint. I have AY, which is 12 and a half kips, right? And then I have AX, which is 15 kips. And now I have my remaining two. So there's my four. Uh, there's my known forces. Now what about my unknowns? Okay. So what I like to do is before I um, uh, start picking arrows and whatnot and things like that, is I start coming up with names for these unknowns. So let's see. Let's start off with this horizontal force. So there's going to be some unknown force in this member, right? I'm going to call that AB. Okay? So that's AB. Then I've got this diagonal. This diagonal, um, whenever I deal with diagonals, I like to split them up into X and Y components. I think that's a lot easier to deal with. So I'm going to have a component here, a component here. And so that's member AB. Let's call that ADX. Let's call that AD, 
Why? Okay. Now, this is a relatively simple trust, so I'm going to try and be a little smart about my assumptions for directions uh, and whatnot. Okay? Now, um, let's make sure that we're clear right off the bat when we start splitting this up into components. Okay? But we'll get to that first. All right. Let's see what we can see here. So I've got X and Y components here. Okay. So if I look at this from a component by component standpoint, let's treat this like a static equilibrium problem. How many unknown components do I have in the horizontal direction? Two. How many unknown components do I have in the vertical direction? One. Okay. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to sum forces in the y direction. Okay. Remember, when we're dealing with joint analyses, we only have two equations of equilibrium. We have the sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero, the sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero. In other words, we do not have the ability, we don't have the ability to consider the sum of moments because there are no moments generated in a system where all the forces all meet at a common point. We can't use sum of moments. But looking at my unknowns, I think it's fair to say that we should consider the sum of the forces in the y direction first. Okay. So th this isn't that complicated, okay? If I have 12 and a half kips going up, what is ADY? 12 and a half kips down. Okay. That's simple. So if you want, you can draw out your table and whatnot. You know, put everything on going up on one side, everything down on the other. Personally, I don't think it's all that necessary for a problem like this. So ADY is 12 and a half kips going down. So I'm going to draw that like that. With me so far? Now, I want to make a little note here off to the side. So make a little note here off to the side. So, here's joint A, and here's joint A, okay? Now, we have an axial member going like this. There are only two ways that that resultant force can go. It can either go in tension, or compression. Now see how this, this is tension, right? Because here's the joint the force is yanking away from. It. So I propose that if this is going up and to the right, then the components would go up and to the right. If the member is in compression and it's going down and to the left, then the components go down and to the left. The point I'm making is that my component arrows either both point toward the joint or they both point away from the joint, okay? So in other words, whenever I solve one component of a diagonal, I can solve for the other immediately, okay? So <clears throat> here's what I'm getting at. Is that right? Is this correct? No. They're either both pointing towards the joint or both away. That's wrong. Okay? So, actually, this component looks like this. Okay? Now, how do we figure out that slope? How do we figure out that, that component? How do we do that? The way that we do that is we use the slope ratio. Okay? Remember, this diagonal... Is that a 3 to 4 slope ratio? Okay. 
Now, from a right triangle standpoint, we're, we're sort of using the tangent because we've got like opposite and adjacent. So if we've got one leg and we need the other, really all we need are these two numbers. Okay. So here's my, my question for you. This, this is sort of how I do this. It's a slow ratio. Would this be a fair way of looking at this? Could I say... Can I do that? That ABX is 3, as ADY is the 4. I know ADY. How do I solve for ADX? I say ADX is 3 quarters of ADY. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, when we plug and chug, what do we get? We get 3 quarters of 11.25. What is 3 quarters of 11.25? Or sorry, 11.25, 12.5. I think I'm, I think I'm thinking it further ahead of the problem. What is 3 quarters of 12 and a half? Yeah, I'm thinking further ahead. 9.375. 9.375. Do I have a second? Yeah. And that's going to be pointing to the left. Shouldn't the horizontal component be smaller? The member is more vertical, right? Our slope ratio indicates that the member is facing more vertical than it is horizontal, so the vertical component should be bigger. And that's exactly what we got here. We got that the horizontal component was less than the vertical, right? So... And we'll use our highlighter here. So, ADX. So. There's our horizontal. There's our vertical. So, if I wanted to solve for AD overall, how would I do that? If I've got the horizontal component, I've got the vert uh, vertical component, what do I use to solve for the result? formula you use probably a hundred billion times, was it? You should use the theory and theorem. Yeah. But I'm going to hold off on that. I'm going to hold off on that. Am I done or am I missing something? What about AB? Yeah, I need to solve for AB. So, how would I do that? Okay, so if I use the sum of forces in the y direction, what's my remaining equation? Sum of forces in the x direction. So, can anybody eyeball this and tell me what is AB going to be? Um, 24.375. It's 24.375 because AD is 9 and change going to the left, 15 going to the left. This has got to be whatever that sum is going to the right. Correct? So... got this going to the right, and this is going to be AB is 24. To the right. I'm getting an offer from Marshall. Is that, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Everybody okay with this? Now, I've got a diagonal, so I'm going to go ahead and take care of this. So, a, uh, AD is AD X squared plus AD Y squared, square root. So what do we get for that? It should be, it shouldn't go out to some crazy decimal value because this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle. It should actually kind of plug in 
close out. So I see here everybody in class brought their uh, Casio FX-115 ES Plus or equivalent scientific calculator, right? Everybody, everybody's like, I'm just going to wait on other people to do the calculation. I see how it is. Anybody got a value for this? Uh, 15.625. All right, second on that? Okay. All right, so the last thing to do is to identify whether or not these members are in tension or compression. So... A, B, and A, D. So what do we have for that? So A, B, let's start off alphabetically, A, B. Here's the joint. I have the force pulling away from the joint. So A, B is 24.375 kips in what? Tension. And then A, D is a magnitude of 16 or 15.625 kips. Both of those components are pointing towards the joint. So A, D is experiencing compression. So... move on, I want to stop, because because I kind of just barreled through a lot of those calculations instead of, you know, taking each one and dissecting it. I kind of just said, all right, here's what we're doing. But let's take a step back, make sure that we're comfortable with this. So the first thing that we did is we drew a free body diagram. That's essentially what we were doing here, is we identified our joint, our members, then we said, okay, what external loads are applied to this joint, this and this. And we said, okay, what's our unknowns? So we have a horizontal component here, a horizontal and vertical. So we looked at our unknowns and we said, what well, makes sense to use the sum of forces in the y direction first, right? So we'll do that first. Then we'll say, that's 12 and a half kips going up. That means that's 12 and a half kips going down. Then if we know the vertical component, we can determine the horizontal component using the slope ratio. And the reason that works is because the only internal force inside the member is axial. That's what our assumptions indicate. So it's got to be, you know, that, that slope ratio has got to work out that way. Then now that we have this horizontal component, that leaves this unknown. Now we've got the whole uh, free body figured out. The rest is just to apply the Pythagorean theorem and to figure out our context, that one member's in tension and one member's in compression. Does that make sense? If you understand that, you pretty much get trust analysis. Like, period. That's pretty much all there is to it. Now, any questions on that? Pardon? Yeah. So okay, we got two questions. Like, you first and you. So now we do that four more times? Pretty much. Yep, pretty much. But we're going to talk about strategy here in a second. So, why don't... I guess I, with Dr. Beating, I think... I remember right, that his strategy is always to assume everything is in compression and then when you get a negative value, it, you know, it's the opposite. That's a good question. That's a good point. So I would say when you're first starting out with trust analysis, that's fair. First off, I tend to assume everything's in tension or whichever. I don't remember which it was. But. We, we, so that's a fair point. So first off, um, when in doubt, I think that's a very fair assessment. Okay. That's point one. Point two there are going to be problems where we have two diagonals, and the only way to solve it is to solve simultaneous equations. And in that instance, I always recommend to assume they're all in tension. Because you end up plugging it into a two-by-two two equation solver, and then if it's negative, you know it's compression. Right? Right. That's point two. All right. But again, when in doubt, if you want to assume tension, that's fine. Okay? What I'm about in here is taking approaches and making them simpler, but using those simple approaches to assess more complicated problems. I think we could just look at that joint and go, that was down. Well, we can, yeah. yeah. And, and I honestly think that the better that you get this and the more practice that you do, that you should employ those, those strategies. I, I am not one that says you must do it my way because I, I don't think that the bridge carrying traffic on Fifth Avenue cares which way you analyze it. It just needs to be right, you know? Right. So I... Personally, I think that you should employ that to your will. As an example, 
I'm a fan of the table, like everything going this right, way and everything right. going that way. When we were going through homework assignments, uh, me and the TA, some of you said, nah, I still want to write the equation. That's fine, as long as it's right. I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm okay with that. So if if it is comfortable for you to assume they're all intention, do it. That's that's totally fine with me. So, as long as in the end, you've got the context indicated. Totally fine with me. Any other questions? This is good stuff. All right, now I want to go back to this little cheat sheet I drew up here. Okay, I'm going to do something. So, first thing I'm going to do, so I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. So see what I did? I colored in the members that I solved. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and write the answers that I figured out. So this one is 24.375 kips in tension. This is 15.625 kips. Why did I do that? Well, can I go ahead and solve joint B? No. No. Why? Three unknowns. There's still, there's still three unknowns. You see what I mean? I can't go ahead and deal with joint B because I still got too many unknowns. But can I do joint D? Yes. So now that we've done a joint, I want to show you why I do this. Okay, so let's sort of game this out. So I solved joint A first. So the next joint I could solve could be joint D. And if I solve joint D, joint D is going to give me this member and this member. So then can I solve joint B? Yes. Okay, so now, so then I'll do joint B. Or, well, really, heck, at that point, you could do any of them, right? Because they all have two unknowns. So maybe after that, I'll do joint B. And then after that, I don't know, joint, I don't know. Which, which, what do you want to do after that, C or E? Because if I do joint B, joint B is going to give me this and this. And then I only have one remaining joint left. Okay. Personally, I'm lazy. I like to do the, the joint that has the least amount going on. I'm going to try and do joint C, because if I look here at the structure, joint C has two members, one load. Joint E has three members, one load. I'm lazy. I don't like drawing more than I have to. So I'm going to do my truss analysis in A, D, B, C. So before I do the problem, I've gained it out. I know what joints I need to solve to solve the whole truss. So go back to something you said, do I do this four more times? Actually, no. I only need to do it three more times. because And the last joint is going to be kind of special. You're going to see something that happens. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Everybody good? Yes. So because AB is in tension at A, does that mean it's opposite at B, or it stays the same? That's actually what you're about to show us. But yeah, the, yeah, I'm getting there. Okay. I'm, uh, you, but that's a, you're basically right, so we're, we're getting to that. Everybody good? Okay, so now we did joint A, so now let's do joint D. Okay? So let's do joint D. All right? So the first thing I want to do is I want to draw the members that are framing into joint uh, uh, D. So here's joint D. Now the members. So the members, we got a member like that. Member like that. Member like that. Now let's deal with the knowns. Okay? So what are the known quantities? Well, first off, at joint D, there is an applied load of 10 kips being applied downward. I'll tell you, one of the most common mistakes when doing a truss analysis is to just forget to put the load on there. It's easy to forget that. So make sure you go back to the truss, you know, you scroll up and you go, wait a minute, that, that's 10 kips down, put the 10 kips down, okay? So there's that. Now hold on. Here's the truss. Here's the members that we know. Okay. So let's see. We don't know this member. I'm going to call that D1. 
DE. We don't know this diagonal here, so I'm going to call that B DX, B DY. We're going to do that at a 3 to 4. But what about this member? Do we know this member? And we just solved this member. This is member AD. We have those components. In fact, I have them highlighted up here. It's like I meant to do that for some reason. All right, so I'm going to draw those in red because I kind of like to indicate my reds as known quantities and my blues as unknowns. So this one is 9.375. This is 12.5. Now notice I didn't, um, or I need to put the units on that. Notice how I didn't draw the directions because I want to uh, uh, lean into the comment you made a second ago. Um, I need to be careful about the direction that I draw my arrows. Okay, so let's let's have a little pop quiz over here. Let's just make sure that we're clear on this. So here's the joint. There's the member. Is that right? It doesn't matter if it's tension or compression. That's not right. Just like that's not right either. That's incorrect. They're either both facing towards the joint or they're both facing away from the joint, right? So our real options, so here's our real options. Either we're like this or we're like that. It's option one. So here, we'll put option one for option two. And how you figure out which option it is, is from this. Member AD, this is member AD, is experiencing compression. Now, the way compression works is you press one end of this calculator, I'll press the other. So we are pressing. He's pressing this way, I'm pressing this way, right? We are we are applying the same force, but in opposite directions. He's pushing this way, I'm pushing this way, but we're both doing the same thing to the calculator. If we wanted to apply tension to the calculator, he would yank it this way, I'm yanking it this way. We're applying forces in opposite directions, even though we're doing the same thing to the calculator. This is compression which means the forces are applied in the direction of the joint. Now that's in the opposite direction that we had up here. Up here, ADX was to the left, now ADX is to the right. Up here, ADY was down, here ADY is up. You can think in opposite arrow directions if you want, or you can think in compression if you want. Just remember that in the end, this is compression. Forces applied towards the joint. Make sense? That's all there is to it. So now we just keep on checking. So, so which one do we do first? Some force of the x direction, some force of the y direction. Why? There's two unknowns in the horizontal direction, one unknown in the vertical. Let's just deal with that first. So, let's see if we can eyeball this. 12 and a half up, 10 down, what does that need to be? Two and a half. Two and a half down. So, so this is down, B, B, Y. It's two and a half down. Now, if that's down, that makes this acting to the left or to the right? To the right. So slope ratio. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say BDX. And BDX is the smaller component. So it either could be 3 fourths or 4 thirds. It's going to be 3 fourths since the X component is smaller. So what is 3 fourths of 2 and a half? I think that's 1.8. 
I think that's right, isn't it? Okay. And so now we sum forces in the x direction. So now we're solving for DE. What's the deal with DE? I've got 9.375 that way. I've got 1.875 that way. So that means that DE needs to go this way towards the left, right? So, and what is DE? What's the magnitude of that? Eleven point two five. Have a second. Yeah. So there we go. So BD. And so I think we can go through that part pretty quickly. So I think that the Pythagorean theorem for that yields uh, 3.125. So therefore, BD in this case is 3.125 kips in tension or compression. Tension. And BE, or sorry, DE. is 11.25 kips in compression. Pretty simple, right? So this is See how we're being pretty systematic with this? Taking our time, but we're making it work, right? Make it work. I don't want to take a sec before we move on to the next one. Just make sure that everybody's good with this. Anybody have any questions? Make sure how we're doing on time. We're doing good. According to our plan that we gained out before we did this, we're going to do joint B. So let's deal with joint B. I'll probably do this one a little fast because I want to show you what happens with joint C. Remember, a member, member, member. Now I know with unknowns we're going to be solving for that one and that one. So. Okay, for knowns, is there a load applied at that joint? I think so. 20 kips. 20 kips. Downward. All right. Now let's go to the known member forces. So this horizontal member, we know this, okay? We know the magnitude is 24.375, so we know this. Do I draw this arrow to the left or to the right? To the left. It is in tension. Tension pulls away from the joint, so this force applies away from the joint. Okay? With this diagonal, I just solved for this. All right? So we've got uh, 1.875 kips. Kips. And this member is in tension. So away from the joint. Okay. Sound good? For the names for these unknowns, we're going to call this, um, this horizontal one is BC. 
This one is B E X B E Y. Slip ratio on this. I'm gonna get in that hat. Something happened. That's the second truck. Okay. So, somebody help me out with an overall strategy for how we're gonna solve this. What are we gonna do first? Some forces in the y direction to get B E Y. Now, I'm curious, based on the numbers, we got two and a half up. But we got 20 down. Is B E Y going to go up or down? Uh, up, right? So this one's going to go up. Which means that one's going to go like that. So let's chug that out. So sun forces in the y direction. And I think mental math tells me that B E Y is at 17 and a half. Okay. So the slope ratio tells us that BEX is three quarters of BEY. And what is that? Uh, is that like 13.125? Yes, sir. Okay, and that's going this way. Now, I'll tell you this. There's a lot going on with the sum of the forces in the x direction, so I think it's perfectly fine to draw a table, you know, which do that for all of them, or write out the equation for all of them. But for this one, it's probably not a bad idea to sum those forces a little bit more formally. So, so what do we got? We got 24.375, we got 1.875, we've got BEX, which is 13.125. I think I got all of them, right? So if I had to guess, bless you, I think BC is probably going to the right based on the numbers. So we can go ahead and draw that one to the right. And so that's, um, what was that, 24.375 plus that. Minus. What's that? 26 and a quarter. Right. 26.25 is BC plus 13.125 kips. I think BC is also 13.125. Yeah. Yeah. So BC is 13.125 kips to the right. And so we can do our slope ratio. Let's see. Okay, we're cutting close on time, but I think we can chug this out. So BE is BEX squared plus BEY squared. Good old Pythagorean theorem. And I'm getting 21.875. Yeah. 21.875. So BE and BC. BC is 13.125 kips in... Um, they're both in tension, right? Yeah, because both of the unknowns are applied away from the joint. Okay. So this is... And then this is... Okay. All right, I really want to show you this last joint, because this last joint is kind of cool. Okay, so we're going to do joint C last. How many unknowns do we have for joint C? One, okay? So we're going to find something kind of nifty. Watch this. Okay, so let's do joint C. Okay, so here's joint C. So here's the joint. We have a member and a member. Now we have a reaction at joint C. The reaction at joint C is 17 and a half kips, okay? Now, what do we know? We know this, right? We know this horizontal is 13.125 kips. The only thing we don't know is this diagonal, okay? 
This is a four to three. And this is C E Y C E X. Check this out. This is this is really cool. Let's look at the directions. Okay. With, look at this free body diagram. Which way does C E X have to go? This is going to left, this is going to the right. Okay? Which way is C E Y going? Okay, look at that. Look, that's right, isn't it? It'd be weird if this was going to the left and this was going up, right? So naturally, at the end, they arrive going in the same direction, right? Okay, now check this out, okay? What is CEX? What's the magnitude? 13.2. Okay. What about the Y? What is this divided by that? What's that? Three over four. The same as the slope ratio. The last joint should serve as a check for the rest of the structure. Okay? What we found is that on this last joint, the diagonals, splitting it up into the components, the components both independently pointed the correct way and independently solving for these components respect to the slope ratio. Now, if you want to solve for the remainder or the, the resultant, that ends up being 21.875. So CE is 21.875 kips in compression. Boom. The truss is solved. Okay? So, how do I want your final answer on the homework? I want it like this. Like, basically, what I want is 21.875 kips in compression. I basically just want, like, this. At the very end. Like a big box like this. I'll put this in the notebook here in a second. But that's it. That's basically truss analysis in a nutshell. Does that make sense? Okay. What we're going to do next time is this. And I'll go ahead and tell you we may not finish the truss. But what we're going to do next time is we're going to take, take a step back and look at internal indeterminacy of trusses. Then we're going to look at a truss where the slope ratios are different. These were all three to four. What if it's three to four and then one's one to two or one to three or two to you know, seven or what have you? So we're going to look at different flip ratios. That's all I got, everybody. I will see you all on Friday. I'll pull up. Does anybody need the code? All right. Let me go ahead and put this answer here in the, um, in the, in the notebook and then call. Yes. Uh.